The degree of a person's ignorance will determine his or her place in the world. Everyone is born ignorant and must for a time live in ignorance. But remember this, anyone who remains ignorant has only himself or herself to blame. An illiterate person in our society is in the lowest level of our social heap. And from that starting point, think once again of society as that pyramid with a broad base gradually rising to a high point. We know that the great majority of people are to be found in the bottom large layers of this pyramid. The higher you go, the smaller the layers. At the very peak of the pyramid, you'll find the world's most brilliant people. We may not have the native equipment to reach the topmost pinnacle, perhaps, although we certainly might. But we do control where we will live between the very top and the very bottom. We can most assuredly get into the top 5%, let's say the top five layers of the pyramid. And from here, we can live well and successfully all the days of our lives. It isn't that we want to be over anyone. It's just having the ambition and good sense to not settle for anything less, to want to live the best we can. Remember, the higher you climb on a pyramid, the farther you can see, the fresher the air, and the less crowded it becomes. Another rewarding thing about climbing is that as we climb, we help most of those associated with us to climb too. One of the most important ladders leading to the top is knowledge. The more we know, the higher we can move. But where does a person begin? No one person can know everything. In fact, our store of knowledge is growing far too fast for anyone to keep up with it. It's like walking into the Library of Congress with its millions of volumes and trying to decide which single book to read first, knowing that even if you lived a thousand years, you couldn't read them all. Well, fortunately, the answer to this perplexing problem is known. A person should begin with the study of his language and then to his general area of interest. Two steps in that order that can move us right up there on the top of the pyramid. First, the language, in our case, English. Not enough people realize that it's our ability to use our language which will determine our place on the social pyramid and which will also control, to a great extent, the amount of money we will earn during our lives. A person may dress in the latest fashion and present a very attractive appearance, so far so good. But the minute he or she opens his or her mouth and begins to speak, he or she proclaims to the world his or her level on our pyramid. Shaw's play Pygmalion, later adapted into the musical comedy My Fair Lady, is an extreme example of what I'm talking about. Our use of the language is the one thing we cannot hide. Many years ago, the graduating class of a large university was given an examination in English vocabulary. The test scores were graded into groups of 5% each, the top 5% and so on to the bottom. At regular intervals during the next 20 years, questionnaires were sent to the surviving graduates, asking them their occupations, incomes, and so on. Without a single exception, those who scored highest on the vocabulary test were in the top income group while those who scored lowest were in the lowest income group. Reader's Digest published an article by Blake Clark entitled Words Can Work Wonders For You. In it, he wrote, tests of more than 350,000 persons from all walks of life show that more often than any other measurable characteristic, knowledge of the exact meanings of a large number of words accompanies outstanding success, end of quote. He also mentioned the work done in this field by scientist Johnson O'Connor and gave O'Connor's best illustration of the importance of vocabulary. Tests were given to executive and supervisory personnel in 39 large manufacturing plants. The results showed that every one of the men tested rated high in the basic aptitudes that go with leadership. Differences in their vocabulary ratings, however, were definite and dramatic. Presidents and vice presidents averaged 236 out of a possible 272 points. Managers averaged 168. Superintendents, 140. Foremen, 114. Floor bosses, 86. In virtually every case, vocabulary correlated with executive level and income. Children with the best vocabularies get the best grades in school. A salesman in his 50s who was in the bottom 5% in vocabulary worked himself into the top 45% and is now vice president of his firm. 
An encouraging fact to keep in mind, Clark went on to say, is that when we master one word, we find that we've added several others. It's as if the new one is a nucleus of thought around which whirl numerous related ideas that we now come to understand. Deliberately learning ten new words, we pick up probably ninety more, almost without realizing it. You see, understanding our language is the key to studying and learning everything else. Literally millions of people are being held back in life simply because they've never taken the time to learn their own language. Let's face it, from the earliest times, the favored class of people has always been the educated class. They can make themselves recognized instantly anywhere by the simple expedient of speaking a few words. Our language, more than anything else, determines the extent of our knowledge. You see, everything in all the vast storehouse of knowledge has a name, a label. These names, these words, make up the language. The more words we know and can properly use, the more knowledge we have. Of this you can be sure. A person's knowledge and his language go together. It's almost impossible for one to be larger than the other. Before we move to the second point, which is knowledge in your field of general interest, make it a point to acquire books that will help you improve your vocabulary. You'll find them valuable additions to your library and an enormous help in your career. In addition to vocabulary, Effective English usage is important. This entails learning the parts of speech, what they mean, how they should be used to construct sentences. This too is a reflection of your present knowledge. Right now, mentally rate yourself on your use of the language. Would you say your rating would be excellent, good, fair, or poor? If you rated yourself excellent, you're in the top one-tenth of one percent of the population. If you said good, you're definitely in the top 5%. If you rated yourself fair, get a good book on English at your bookstore and study it. And if you rated yourself as poor, take a home study or night course in English. Many excellent courses are available. Impress on your youngsters the importance of knowing their language, the importance of speech. More people speak English now than any other language on the planet, with the possible exception of Chinese. English literature, from Chaucer to Eliot, from Shakespeare to Hemingway, is the richest and most extensive on earth. So when you're studying English, you're studying one of the world's greatest and most interesting subjects. If you think you don't have time to study, listen to what Lewis Shores has to say about this. He said each of us must find his own 15-minute period each day for reading. It's better if it's regular. The only requirement is the will to read. With it, you can find 15 minutes no matter how busy the day. That means you'll read half a book a week, two books a month, 20 a year, and 1,000 in a reading lifetime. It's an easy way to become well-read, and it takes just 15 minutes a day. Now let's get to our second area of study, our general interest. Everyone has something in which he or she is interested more than in other subjects. This is true of the salesperson, doctor, architect, executive, or student. Reading in this area is for profit, and we should read for pleasure as well. Once we have a regular program going along to improve our knowledge of our language, we should begin a systematic study of the field which interests us most and which will help us reach our goal just that much sooner. I received a letter from one of my radio listeners, a woman, saying it was her ambition to write poetry. There was a telephone number on her letter, so I called her. I asked her how long she'd been studying poetry and what kind of a collection of published poetry she had. She told me she didn't have a single book on poetry and had never read it as a study. I mention this because it's so often the case. People will say they want to do a particular thing, but a bit of questioning quickly reveals that it's a whim, not a real and important goal. If we're interested in boating, we subscribe to boating magazines and usually have a collection of books on boating. Stories of the Sea, a collection of the works of Conrad, and we usually know, down to the bilge pumps and mooring lines, exactly the kind of boat we want. I know because I have such a collection. I also have a wonderful collection of books on English, including poetry, great fiction, the great books, several excellent dictionaries, and a number of books on writing and style, and mistakes to avoid. Our company has published on tape cassette one of the finest programs on vocabulary building ever put together. And you can listen to it and repeat the words as you drive your car. Other motorists might think you're a bit batty, but 
You'll be learning in the best way possible by listening and repeating a fine vocabulary of the English language. Most languages can number their words under 200,000. The English language has more than 600,000 and is still growing every day. None of us can learn them all, although professors of English come very close. Incidentally, the number two person in the country in the use of his language is the corporation president, and that's no accident. Our ability to translate our thoughts and ideas into words in a powerful and effective way is inextricably linked to our growth in the world of business or any other organization. In addition to English, each of us should have a good working knowledge of world history, and especially the history of our own country and the history of the idea of human freedom. Millions of Americans don't know how truly fortunate they are to be able to openly criticize their government and its leaders, to be able to bring suit against public officials, to call an attorney of their choice in case of arrest and be judged by a jury of their peers. Did you know that as far as is known, there has never been a sentence of innocent in the Soviet court? If you go to trial in Russia, believe me, you're guilty, and you're going to prison or a work camp. In hundreds of countries, you could be subjected to torture without recourse. My wife and I were talking to a couple in South Africa some years ago, a white couple, and they said to us with feeling, my God, when the plane lands in the United States, you can smell the freedom. Most Americans, believe it or not, don't know anything about the idea of personal liberty, nor how difficult it was to come by, nor how precious it is nor do they have the foggiest notion of their true options and opportunities. I think a good personal library is essential. It should contain good books and a dozen or so excellent tape cassette programs. The tape cassette is the greatest idea for learning since the invention of the printing press. It's effortless, yet so effective. When you listen to the human voice, you're learning the way you learned most of what you know. It's the most natural way to learn. And while a book is often read only once, Tape cassettes can be listened to over and over again, months and years later. And perhaps most importantly, they can be listened to while doing other things, while dressing in the morning, while driving the car, while having a snack or at the dinner table so that the entire family can soak up some information. Those without a good library, and they don't even build bookshelves in American homes anymore, unless they're specified by an architect, they're seriously handicapped. They miss so much of the fun, the joy of learning the things we want to learn. Books and cassettes are not an expense item. They're an investment, and as far as we know, the best investment on Earth. They pay us dividends out of all proportion to their small cost, and not just in pleasure and knowledge, but in cash, in income. As someone has written, books extend our narrow present back into the limitless past. They show us the mistakes of the men and women before us, and share with us recipes for human success. There's nothing to be done which books and let me add tape cassettes will not help us do much better. To try to live without constantly expanding our knowledge is to close our eyes not just to the whole purpose of life, but to the facts of life as well. Never before has the world moved so rapidly as it's moving today. We must make up our minds to move with it, to stay up with it, to grow and prosper with it, or just fall by the wayside. Not just because it's the best way to our goals, but because it's the way to really enjoy living, as the skillful sailor enjoys the sea. So often a person will live in the shallows from force of habit, or because those around him are wasting their time without realizing that only a thin screen of reeds separates him from the fine deep ocean beyond. He or she can sail to any chosen port, if the time has been taken and the effort expended, to build a good boat. Now let me make an important point. The person who knows where he or she is going and who's made up his or her mind to get there is going to make the grade regardless of education. If an education is necessary to the accomplishment of the goal, well, he or she will get it. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence and determination. I think it's important to succeed in every department of our lives and becoming well-educated is one of the most vital. What good is a large material success if a person has remained too ignorant to enjoy it or to administer it? Now let's recap. Knowledge is power. The more our knowledge, the more power we can exercise over our lives and our futures. Think of human society as a pyramid composed of layers beginning with the broad base 
and narrowing to a pinnacle at the top. Pick the place on the pyramid you're going to shoot for and start climbing. Since there's far too much knowledge for any one person to assimilate, where can we start? First, with our language, and next, with our general area of interest. Two subjects which can keep us growing and interested for the rest of our lives. Remember that our language is the one thing we cannot hide except by silence. Let's bring it up to the point where it can do the job for us we want it to do. To a surprising extent, our ability to use our language and the extent of our vocabulary will determine our income and our future. Use our excellent cassette programs in vocabulary building and spend at least 15 minutes every day reading something not only interesting, but calculated to stretch your mind a little more. Remember that a mind stretched by a new idea can never again return to its original dimensions. It's estimated that the average person adds only five new words a year to his or her vocabulary. That's not nearly enough for this day and age. We should add that many a week. Many popular magazines publish features which will help you in this area. And finally, realize that graduating from school is just the beginning, the commencement of our days and years of learning. For with wisdom will come kindness and patience, love, understanding, and success as a person. It's never too late to begin.